Hello, and you are back in the Velvet Room with Joker the Fool. This is our 24th episode, and today we will be discussing Obama's projection of epic proportions, and Holly Weird is getting back to work. So we're going to get right into this with this Fox News article that I saw discussing Obama saying that all of us are complicit in the Israel-Hamas conflict, and he urges us to acknowledge the whole truth. Now let me just start by acknowledging the whole truth that Obama was given a Nobel Peace Prize for basically bombing children in the Middle East with drones. Now, of course, that's not what they actually gave it to him for, but he did that, and then he got a Nobel Peace Prize um, for peace. So to be speaking about people's hands being clean and uh, any sort of, like, moral arbitration coming from this man is fundamentally ridiculous to me. So I just want to wholeheartedly call this out so we'll get right into uh, this article it's linked in the uh, description on the uh, substack so you, you can check the whole article out if you want to it says hamas was uh, what hamas did was horrific no justification for it uh you have to acknowledge the whole truth goes on about anti-semitism says that talking about uh this on social media is bad but the biggest thing like like i said saying that Nobody's hands are clean. We're all complicit to some degree. Uh, it, it is ridiculous to me. This is a man who eight years ran the American war machine of um, the American empire and a lot of lives lost. Not only uh, you know the Middle Eastern um, lives, you know with the proxy war we're fighting in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, those sorts of things, but you know all the uh, soldiers. Uh, uh, American soldiers that needlessly um, died or were horrifically scarred mentally and physically because of the empire building we were doing in the Middle East that Obama continued from, you know, the two Bushes and, and the Clinton, you know, Clinton and Bill Clinton, you know, you had the Gulf War stuff and Kuwait, all that. Obama just, you know, took that torch and he, he carried on uh, it on through with uh with all the drone strikes and all these sorts of things that he did. So to say that, you know, all of us are complicit uh, is fundamentally ridiculous because I'm not the one who's saying, you know, war should be a thing or that uh, Israel or Hamas should be going at it at all. They're just going to do that because they they fundamentally hate each other and they only want um, that area of land, uh, Israel, Palestine, whatever you want to call it, to be ruled by one state and it's most likely going to be either Israel or Palestine ruling over ashes at this point if things keep going the way that they seem to be going. And the best thing for us to do, the American empire, is to not involve ourselves with it and to get out of it. But of course, you can't tell that to uh, somebody like Obama, who, you know, was commander in chief of the American war machine, who did. Um, a lot of empire building in the Middle East, or at least try to, whatever your perspective is on that. So, of course, you know, maybe he feels guilty about that. Maybe he feels bad about that and says, hey, you know, it's not just me, you know, for eight years being the commander in chief of the American military and um, inflicting what I did on the Middle East. It's not my fault that the Middle East is um, like that. It's everybody's fault, including me. But, but, you know, we're, I'm trying to, you know, spread the blame around so that way I don't look nearly as bad as I uh, do for bombing children and innocent civilians with uh, drones. Uh, basically every chance I got, right? Um, so that that's the whole thing is that, uh, one, I just want to call this article out. I want to laugh at it and I want to say that, uh, no, uh, Obama's got much more blame um, to carry than basically any average American does for what's going on in the Middle East. Now, that's not to say that he's directly responsible. Like I said, carrying on the torch of running the American war machine from his uh, presidential predecessors. And, you know, there's all the history that was going on. But, you know, for thousands of years, literally, um, with that. So to say, you know, it's all Obama's fault would be fundamentally ridiculous as well. But to say that it's the average American's fault or that we're all complicit in this conflict is uh, ridiculous. I mean, you could say, you know... Tax, paying taxes, but, you know, that, that's a whole, you know, thing, you know, with, with theft and it's not voluntary and the whole thing is that, you know, that's more like the government imposing taxation on the people and then using that money to run the war machine. They're more to blame for what the war machine's doing than the people who are just paying their taxes, right? <clears throat> so that is what I have to say 
about Obama saying that we're all complicit. We are not. It's the um, it's the American war machine's involvement in this conflict that's more complicit than the Americans, and it's the IDF and Hamas who are committing atrocities against each other and blaming um, the other side for the reason why they happened in the first place and saying, well, you know, the IDF did this to us, we have to take out um, the IDF, and Hamas did this to us, we have to take uh, them out, and if you disagree with us, you know, taking it to Hamas in uh, Gaza uh, and Palestine, then you're a terrorist sympathizer, and if you, you know, support the IDF, you're a Zionist pig, you know, of course, you know, it's war. That's how you're going to be. You're going to be as propagandized and um, polarized as possible when you're in a state of war. And that, that's what you're seeing right there. So those are my thoughts. I, I've talked about uh, this conflict before. Don't take sides in it. Just um, be neutral in it and say, hey, what's going on, in, um, what's going on between uh, Israel and Palestine is between solely Israel and Palestine. And that's how it should be. Nobody else should get involved. But unfortunately, we are going to get involved because the American war machine runs on war, right? And it's very good for the economy, and we uh, are an empire, so empires are built on expanding, right? That, that's how you build out an empire. You are always expanding it. You're always building it. You're always trying to get more land and resources to be under the rule of your empire, and that's why we have to... You know, have our have our forward operating base out of Israel, so we're going to support Israel, whether you like it or not. So that's it. But I think I've waxed uh, poetic about this topic long enough, and we'll get into the second topic of Hollyweird getting back to work. So the writer's strike ended a while ago, and now the actor strike, it seems, just today it was today at midnight. I'm recording this on Thursday. Um, so it's been about 17 hours. The writer strike has ended. Tentative deal. I haven't researched that much into it. Uh, I really don't need to. It seems like it's going to go through most likely. And Hollywood, Hollyweird, whatever you want to call it, is going to get back into the full swing of things starting very soon. And I don't think that really changes much of anything in the average person's life. You know, I'm a bit disappointed. I wanted this to go on to the new year, make it even more of a disaster for all parties involved. But it is a good thing that the uh, average people who work in films, the gaffers, the grips, the editors, those those sorts of people who uh, are, are just not making the big bucks um, from the productions, they're going to get back to work, they're going to get their incomes back, so that's a good thing, uh, I won't knock, um, that aspect of it, but, uh, it is really sad to see where the entertainment industry is at, that more people, I want to say more people, but it was, I would say, in my opinion, more entertaining to see these strikes go on than what the, than the content that they're actually producing, right, so this really does not change much of anything, um, you know, instead of no content being made, the content's going to be made and no one's going to watch it, so the net result is going to be the same anyway, and this just uh, proves how fragile and shaky uh, the entertainment industry is, and I do not think that um, a strike isn't going to happen again when these contracts run up, because I don't think they're the best deals, and you're dealing with people who always want more, right? This is operating out of um, Los Angeles and New York, a little bit of Texas and Georgia now, but New York and Los Angeles, those are the two biggest um, places for movie production. That's where you go if you want to make it in the mainstream film industry. And these are, you know, the hotbeds of acting entitled, always wanting more. You know, I've talked about Rachel Zegler. Those types of people are going to be the type of people who just want it all, want it more, and they're very susceptible to propaganda. The perfect people to um, be convinced to go on strike. So if a strike um, is going to happen again, I don't see I don't see a strike not happening again when these contracts run up or just more shenanigans taking place. And of course, um, most of these studios are all in on being as um, ESG friendly as possible. So in the name of uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, they're going to tank all of their content into the ground. And most people are not going to engage with it. And of course, you're going into like multi-million dollar production. So the uh, profit margins aren't going to be there and the amount of money they're going to lose is going to be 
way too much. So I do think that the Hollywood getting back into the full swing of things does not change much. And the fact that the strikes went on for so long means that Hollywood's meaningfully set back. And this is after them just, I would say, starting to recover after the uh, setback in production that COVID gave them. You know, all the, all the lockdowns and all that bullshit that they had to deal with. Um, with all the uh, regulations that you had to adhere to during that COVID era for, you know, two, two and a half years. Uh, just getting back into being able to produce um, completely after that. And then the strikes happen. So now there's uh, another hurdle in terms of getting back onto a good production schedule they're going to have to get into. That's why so much stuff got delayed. And I'm sure more stuff is going to get delayed as... Um, all the kinks get ironed out, and, and like I said, you're, you're dealing with people who really are in the mindset of being as productive as possible. Uh, a lot of lazy, entitled brats, I would say, and they're just going to make Holly weird even weirder, right? Uh, uh, but those are my thoughts for um, that topic, and I think that's a great place to leave it there, and we are heading into the outro now. I hope you enjoyed this one. Thank you for being in the Velvet Room with Joker the Fool. Be sure to follow my substack, velvetroompublishing.substack.com, to read Machine to Man and all my other projects.